Thank you. <clears throat> and also a bit rusty in English, so do bear with me. Um, I thought that I, I would uh, speak to you today on, on the case of uh, Pierre Schaeffer, not strictly from an intermediate point of view, because I cannot in, in, true, uh, um, in true justice say that I'm an intermediate uh, researcher yet. But I am interested in this approach, and I have been reading a few things and listening to all, uh, all you people for a while now. So I hope you will see as I as I do the connections and the resonances that could uh, come out of this uh, proposal. Um, I thought that I would uh, discuss the case of Pierre Schaeffer because it is such an ambivalent and, and complex figure. Is a famous unknown, really. Uh, as uh, we will see. Uh, so I'll try to keep this uh, three-part uh, um, um, conference. First, try to situate Pierre Schaeffer's uh, trajectory within his time and uh, the main uh, questions of his time. And those were really profound questions. And I hope to convey to you that uh, his uh, attempts were uh, uh, well thought of and um, um, quite efficient in this context. OK, let's go. As I said to begin with, the case of Pierre Schaeffer is quite an intriguing one, because we, we might, all of us, I suppose, know him as the inventor of music concrete and one of the forerunners of uh, electro electronic uh, music, as we say in English, or electroacoustic music. We, say in French because it's more uh, a more open definition. Um, but truth is uh, that his proposals were quite uh, complex in, in fact. And uh, as I put it here, um, we may see Pierre Schaeffer as a kind of a reluctant messiah to borrow the, the phrase from Richard Barker's famous book, The Illusions or the Reluctant and Messiah, which is good fit in this conference, uh, uh, by the way. Uh, because in, on the one hand, he did propose one of the most famous uh, imp um, improvement or uh, forward-looking proposals for music of the century. And on the, at the same time, he denounced it completely. And the only, one, the only time I met him, he said, it would have been better if I wrote books instead of uh, trying to do music. <laughs> Much to my surprise, you may imagine. I became the, the, the scientific advisor for his uh, personal archives for about uh, seven years in, uh, in Paris when those archives were uh, in Montreuil. Mm -hmm. And for many reasons, now they are in Caen, if you uh, feel inclined to uh, go in depth into your chef. OK. To understand Schaeffer, you have to understand his time. And uh, you may not be able to see all of those elements here, but the main purpose of this uh, diagram is to show to you that new music in general, and electroacoustic music in particular, came at a convergence point of many factors. You can just cannot isolate purely musical or purely political or purely technological uh, elements. In this sense, this is quite an intermediate point of view. I was doing intermediate stu studies with, before knowing I was doing it. Um, OK, so his times were complex. You had the downfall of uh, tonal music, obviously. You had the downfall of traditional arts in general. You had uh, a lessening, a very strong lessening of self-confidence uh, of Western civilization. You had the impact of uh, the colonies. You had the shocks of the uh, economies uh, that were going down between 1900 and 1929. Uh, all, all of those factors were uh, at a role to play, at a part to play in, in this story. Obviously, for music, those elements were very important. Uh, the main idea yeah, is that music was in a state of crisis after Wagner because uh, Wagner pushed music so much forward in all its traditional dimensions that you had a, 
a big problem to deal with afterwards, what to do after time. In a way, you could say that the traditional models of music, the vocal model, I call it, uh, became really overused and uh, there, there was needed a very strong renewal of music because of that. And in my view, a, a second model came out around 1900. I call it the percussive model or the noisy model. <laughs> Don't have much time to develop on this point right now, but uh, the, the main idea is that you have to renew music and search music in other dimensions than the vocal traditional melodic sense. I think everybody can get that. And the answer to that was percussion, noises, colors, tones, and sounds like that. Okay, that's the backdrop of Pierre Schaeffer. A second point, Pierre Schaeffer, this is not well known, was actually a very strong neoclassicist, which could come as a surprise for those who don't know him. Uh, he was raised in a very classical musical family. He went to the conservatory in Nancy, and also when he moved to Paris as a sound a radio engineer, to, to study radio engineering, he was taking a music lessons with Nadia Boulanger. And many of you may know Nadia Boulanger. She was a famous teacher, music teacher in Paris and in Fontainebleau. And she was the main uh, propagator of the neoclassicist movement in France and in America. Uh, so this is not a light point. It's, it's a very strong point, in fact. Schaeffer was not part of the avant-garde at all. He was not close to Schoenberg, he was not close to Boulez, he was not close to any of the avant-garde movement, in fact. And he was way closer to Cocteau, two drawings of Cocteau here. Um, in this case, the, the, the myth of Orpheus. And this is a significant point because in the 1920s and 30s, after the really wild experimentation in music and arts in general of the Dadaist movement or the, the premises of the surrealist movement, um, Schaeffer was not on the good side of that dilemma. He was on the conservative side. And this shed some lights on his attempts because, and this comes in resonance with the theme of this conference, authenticity. That's a very strong point here. One of the good reasons <clears throat> uh, that, that makes a case for neoclassicism in those years was a search for musical authenticity. You may not believe it, or you may believe it as you wish, but the fact is that for many of those artists, going back to tradition, was felt as a return to artistic authenticity. And um, uh, his music history of the avant-garde gave uh, made this point of view rather wrong. But still, it was an impact on that generation and an impact on Schaeffer in particular. Uh, OK. The second um, point that I need to make is that uh, Schaeffer did not think of himself as a musician, although he was a fully trained musician. He thought of himself as a writer, and a writer in the French, in the middle of uh, the 20th century writer. This is very, very intermediate again. Um, he was close to uh, Gide, to Cocteau, to Claudel, and other things. OK, the time runs really quick, so I skip on this part. Uh, just a little uh, reminder, neoclassicist uh, tendencies in the, the sh big shows, the big official shows of the 1940s. He, he actually was the main leader of uh, this uh, uh, Portique à Jeanne d'Arc in 1941, where the Jeune France movement was, uh, became uh, well known in France. And uh, we now can see that this is the, the, um, the network we would say today of those neoclassicists, but not only the conservative neoclassicists, also the progressive neoclassicists, if I can coin the term. For instance, Messian and Jolivet, 
were involved there too. They were not complete conservatives, and later on they became much more progressive music-wise. But still, it was a show for the official regime, uh, with, with the almost fascist tendencies. Uh, big shows are like the Italian state, or are like the German state. This is important. That was his first big public act, not an avant-garde uh, research. OK, not surprising then. Afterwards, after the 1940s, when his own thinking was more developed and he started to produce uh, interesting musical works, um, he felt really uh, bounded to neoclassicist uh, tradition. The figure of Orpheus came around very often. In 1951, uh, he, he, he did um, a uh, music concrete version of uh, Orpheus on stage in the Nawa Schengen. It was a big scandal. The, the piece did not work too well because of all those old fashioned remains. There is no time to listen to many examples, unfortunately. If I wish to go ahead, if we have time at the end, we might uh, go further. Um, another little sign here that's a bit later when. Uh, early 50s when the, the um, uh, music concrete was starting to gain speed and becoming interesting. Uh, Schaeffer was not pleased at all with the fact that there's no performers in music concrete. Uh, so his, his impulsion always was to come back to the traditional ways of, of doing things. Okay. What happened? There was a crisis. Um, a crisis both in the social and political uh, sense and also in a personal level. In 1940, as you know, France lost the war against the Germans in 1939. And um, they became uh, collaborators of the, the Nazis in different little with subtleties, but still. From that point on, Schaeffer was a man of his country and a man of his time, um, a good soldier, as he put it, as he puts it, started to have doubts. And exactly at the time where he was putting together this big uh, Jeanne d'Arc show, he started to doubt his orders and started to doubt the, um, the true uh, uh, purpose of the Vichy regime. And um, this uh, 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 worsened uh, when his wife died in terrible, uh, in terrible pain and with no uh, health care uh, at all. It was a really bad situation for him. So around 1942, he had a big change of mind. <clears throat> Um, he did not quite put it in those words. His own words were in, in this, this uh, citation here. But you could compare his attitude to the one of Pierre Boulez later on. Uh, when Boulez talked about corruption in the censors, you know, rotten things in the censors who are supposed to smell good in the church. And uh, he felt that the the, the Vichy regime was uh, debatable, or even he had to oppose it. And from that point on, he, he stopped being a good soldier and became his own man, uh, much to the difficulties of his later career. In a way. And this led him step by step in the political way to become a resistant. And he was the one, the, the leader of the, the radio uh, resistance. He's the one who took care of the radio during the uh, liberation of Paris in 1944. He's the one who occupied the, the radio waves for uh, six days and had the, the bells of Paris uh, ringing and all kinds of things like that. He moved with his team, he moved the, uh, the emitter of the, of the resistance around Paris not to be caught by the Germans. So he was a true resistance. And for that reason, he became the director of the French radio in 44, for about six months. 
and then he stopped following the goals orders and he was uh, he was put aside but this gave him a peculiar status both as a war hero and as a, a unwieldy man as a almost um, a man impossible to 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 canalize or to channel Okay, so what did he do with this time then? He could not be a major administrator as he used to be. He had to do something. And his something was an intermediate convergence of writing and music, obviously the reading. In the 30s, you all know the importance of radio. Radio occupied the, the role of the major media of the time uh, with all the the habits that we now associate with uh, television or uh, the web, most of the those ideas were actually developed for radio. And the creative types took uh, charge of the radio at the time. And we see here a picture taken in a famous 1942 um, uh, seminar, I would say, stage in French. Uh, in Bonn, where Jacques Copeau, the famous uh, director, the founder of the Théâtre du Vieux Colombier, second most important theater in Paris, um, met with Schaeffer and they organized a group to create a new breed of musicians that could really use the radio as a, an expressive tool. Um, just a bit later, he uh, composed or wrote the libretto for a radio play, a multi-episode radio uh, series called uh, La Coquilla Planet. And it's while doing this Coquilla Planet that his main ideas uh, were developed and will, would lead him towards the invention of concrete, music concrete. Since I'm already quite, <clears throat> it's about half. Yeah. Okay, let's move on. Ok, just a little bit here. Je crois qu'on perd son temps avec ce client-là, c'est un amateur. Allez, 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 laisse-moi au téléphone. Non, attendu, non, ça c'est bon. Je fais les bons routes perses. Allez, pas mon petit cadeau. Oui, c'est le voir quelque part. Oh, enfin. Ok, it's a, it's a radio play, it's a initi initiation play of, of a kind, with a young man moving around Paris, a bit like uh, Ulysses around the, the Greek islands. So it's much more than well, um, five minutes? Okay. Okay, no time for me. Okay, let's go straight to the point. Okay, I was talking about the percussive, the percussive uh, mutation of the time. And uh, just a little uh, example of that. You find this percussive evolution of uh, Western culture everywhere in the 30s and 40s. The drum set becomes a, a major instrument. You find noises in all kinds of situations. Even in the very pop, poppy song of Charles Trenet, you have uh, allusions to noises and, 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 and non-musical sounds becoming important. And this is precisely the context. <laughs> it's also the time where Foley became very important. Uh, having uh, an enlarged importance from theater, then cinema, sound cinema. And Foley art, as you probably are aware, greatly improved when you put a microphone in front of the uh, Foley artists. It changes everything. It remediates the sound of Foley artists. And with such a tool, um, the microphone becomes uh, an enlarged ear and reveals all kinds of sonic possibilities that were not there before. Sound art that will be derived from that is quite clearly the result of the encounter of new artistic ideas, a new uh, the will to do to to do an improved music and the sound uh, apparatus, the microphone and the recording. Um, the magnetophone. Okay, so time. With this tool, in search of a more authentic music, Schaeffer used the recording, uh, much like the cinema is doing, 
uh, registering little bits and pieces of sonic reality and uh, reworking them in order to create a new kind of uh, art. He called that music concrete uh, in order to oppose it to the usual musical way of doing things, starting with a musical idea, writing the score, having the musicians perform and create the reality of the sound. He called it music concrete because when you use recording, you start with the, the, uh, the real recording and you build an abstract work of art. And particularly, this is at the same time totally uh, illusionistic, and yet at the same time tries to go towards more authenticity. It, that, that's where the paradox, Schaeffer's paradox lies. He wanted the authenticity of the sounds in order to reveal the authenticity of music that he felt was lost in overly written uh, avant-garde music. And in doing so, he invented a totally artificial totally illusionistic tool. And I think that's why it's an interesting case for this, uh, this thing. Two minutes? One. One. OK, well, I one, said. One and a half. OK. No. I, I said the main idea, really. And uh, I could develop much further. But let's listen to the, the music. I think it talks for itself. Instead of listening to Etude de Chemin de Fer, which is very well known and not very well understood. I prefer to listen to Etude Pathétique. In Etude Pathétique, Schaeffer is surrounded by five uh, turntables, five pickups with the records he prepared, and he's improvising. The, listen to that. You see exactly what I meant. A new kind of music, somewhat surrealistic, but not completely, with a, a very sensitive, uh, um, search for sonic um, authenticity and at the same time creating a full illusion. It's not sonic illustrations, it's a complete reworking of the recordings. Almost nothing is changed in the sounds, it's very natural. Maybe sometimes it's with loops, the case here. The piano is fully recognizable, the metal boxes are recognizable, but yet at the same time it goes towards some kind of dreamlike state and brings us into a uh, encompassing uh, environment. <clears throat> and reveals his own sensitivity, which is not always the case in which you This is the invention of world music too, and sonic poetry and all, all that. So I tried to show, I did not get all the details, but I tried to show to you how the contradictions of a, a period led him towards this ambiguous uh, uh, posture, uh, looking for authenticity, using illusion to, uh, to reveal authenticity. And it's the start of a whole new era of music. Thank you, Martin, for that um, great presentation. We have still time for discussion. Thanks very much. I really enjoyed it.
really have loved to hear more. Um, yeah, well, um, I can talk yeah, for hours about that, that obviously. History. Um, I was intrigued by your notion of writer, how she yeah. saw himself as a writer. You know, yeah. I, I think I see what you mean coming from theater studies, yeah. like écriture scénique. So I was yeah. wondering if this is something similar or. Well, he actually wrote uh, eight novels and big essays, oh, really? and he was published really along with the best of his generation in, uh -huh. in Edition du Seuil. Uh -huh. He was close friends with Edition du Seuil founders. He, he, he started writing his journal when he was uh, a teenager and published a major paper, and he was maybe 17 or 18. His first novel was called uh, Clotaire Nicole, uh, 36, I believe, something like that. He was a true accomplished writer. And uh, his essays are very personal. He talks about communication. He's, he's a theoretician of media, uh, not quite McLuhanian, uh, radically opposed to McLuhanian. So he was against uh, modelization. He is quite a peculiar character, really. And always in those ambivalence, always in contradictions. He was close to Gurdjieff as a mm. guru, uh, and he used contradiction as a tool to liberate the minds of the people when they, so he said. He said that later in the sense. Thank you very much for the presentation. I mean, the college has been done wondering how you people have performed this piece. Uh, that that la last one? Yeah. Very simply, he had, uh, it, it, it built loops. At the time to do a loop, you had to scratch a record. So, so yeah, you have these, a pile of records, scratch records, and they would play infinitely like that. And you just mix them like, like a DJ. That's it. <laughs> and not more than that. But he, he, he had chosen good recordings, interesting recordings, and he had thought about how to put them together. But see, it's mostly an improvisation. And, and for one little anecdote that's funny, he actually picked up a record by, um, done by, um, um, what's his name? The famous actor of the time, the French, uh, ah, uh, Sacha Guitry. Mm -hmm. And uh, that record could not be used uh, for broadcast because somebody coughed. So he reused this, <laughs> this record and you hear the cough and going in the loop and all that. <laughs> The tape was easy and compared to the record. They, they had to glue it, but the, yeah. the squash didn't hold it. <laughs> mm, that's right. Yeah. So there, there was a lot of accidents of uh, yeah. sounds or noises yeah. that were appearing during the record. And that probably was repeated and then to reach the result they wanted. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, well. I wrote many papers on, on, on this topic. Electroacoustic music is always a fight between the dream and the realities. And um, uh, the dreams are big because you want to have the machine that does everything, <clears throat> that fully realizes one's intuitions. And, and yet you have to fight with technology to obtain that, just a bit of that. Uh, the computer was born that way too, the musical computer. Um, but the fact is, it's, that's why this example is so intriguing, I find. Because with very, very minimal technology, almost no interventions, there's no filtering, no sophisticated anything. Schaeffer was actually against sophistication. But just his thought and his sense of writing. Yeah. Okay, thank you so much. Um, again, about uh, this interview background. Yeah. Was there um, a direct connection to people uh, and works that they have gathered to yeah. the two studies? Yeah, there was, there was a connection. Was, what was the direct connection? Uh, um, at the time, uh, Cocteau was uh, was uh, had, had done his first uh, Orpheus movie or was in the process of writing it. And uh, Schaeffer was felt close to Maria Cazares. I believe Maria Casares was involved in that famous 1942 uh, event in Bonn, or P 
people closer. Suzanne Flon was there, I'm sure. And other very famous actors of that same group. And um, Maria, Cazares, Maria Cazares was such a strong actress that everybody were, was, uh, were impressed by that. So in a way, he tried to put a Cazares-like figure with a com music concrete, and he found a good uh, singer to do it. A French uh, um, um, uh, um, uh, Spanish origin. The picture I showed with the lira that is, that was uh, from a, a stage play of uh, Monteverdi's Orfeo. So there's a connection. Those, those neoclassicists, they were quite a small group in Paris. They were all related to one another, and they constantly met in Nadia Boulanger's salon. You had the Poulenc, you had the Cocteau, you had Mio. Thank you, Martin. Our next speaker is Jonathan Goldman. He's Associate Professor of Musicology in the Faculty of Music at the University of Montreal. And he is a performer of the Hungarian Museum of the Soviet Great. Thank you, Clement. Uh, the title of my talk is Double Groups and the Stereo LP, Spatialized Works by Boulez and Stockhausen. Um, and Fusseur, actually, I'm not going to, in the end, because of time constraints, I'm not going to be able to get, talk about Fusseur as the artifice of an artifice. Between March 1958 and October 1960, no fewer than six major works by prominent European avant-garde uh, composers um, for multiple spatially distributed orchestral groups received their first performances. Boulez's double, which would later be expanded into the work Figure Double Prisme and Poésie pour Pouvoir, Stockhausen's Gruppen and Carré, and Henri Pousseur's Rime pour Multiples Sources Sonores were sometimes premiered days apart in key musical centers like Paris, Cologne, and Donau Eschingen. The sheer number of such compositions presented over some two and a half years is striking. Some of the most prominent ones uh, are listed on this slide in chronological order. Of course, many other composers and works could be added to this list who composed multi-orchestral pieces at this time. You have Luciano Berrio's Alleluia II, for example, for five orchestral groups, uh, premiered in May of 1958. You have uh, Gunther Schuller's Spectra, uh, which a contemporary critic described as an interesting example of music that tries to capture a stereophonic sound, unquote. Uh, and it was premiered by the New York Philharmonic in January of 1960. Um, Canadian composer Harry Summers, 1962 orchestral work Stereophony, also comes to mind, uh, also for separated ensembles of the orchestra, um, as do many uh, works by seasoned spatialist composer Henry Brandt. Uh, the Japanese composer Toshiro Maizumi, um, his Nirvana Symphony for three orchestral groups and choir uh, has a score that indicates that the orchestra is divided into three groups and in order to get a crisscrossing stereophonic sound effect, each group should be placed in separate positions in the auditorium. And it was premiered exactly two weeks before the premiere of Boulez's Double in March of 1958, but in Tokyo. It's instructive, I think, to regard these key works as owing their existence in part to the specific characteristics of the historical era into which they were launched. One of the important developments of this era concerns sound recording, specifically the commercial introduction of stereo long playing records that led to the mass distribution of stereo sound into homes throughout the world. Stereo radio transmission also started to come of age uh, around uh, this time over the course of the subsequent decade. To what extent then were listeners' experiences of spatialized works in the concert hall informed by their new familiarity with stereo sound in the home or in the cinema? To what extent did composers respond to listeners' expectations about stereo in their spatialized works? Confronting listeners' reactions reveals uh, the extent to which the new modes of technologically assisted listening informed concert goers' experiences, even when, uh, as is the case for these works, uh, they do not employ any electronic means as such. 
Stereophony had been demonstrated by Bell Labs as early as 1933, and the experience of multi-channel sound had been employed in movie theaters since the 1940s, notably through Cinemascope and Cinerama technology. Stereo technology had also been adapted for the home use uh, beginning in 1953 when two-track stereo tape uh, was available to audio enthusiasts, uh, and beginning in 1958 on stereo LPs. From then on, stereo sound would be distributed on a massive scale. Record companies across North America and Europe uh, took to releasing 7 and 12 inch stereo demonstration discs, um, which included musical excerpts that highlighted the advantages of stereophonic sound over mere mono high fidelity. A powerful marketing campaign initiated in the pages of newspapers and in audio magazines ensured that stereophony was never far from the thoughts of the average music lover. The apotheosis uh, of this uh, propaganda campaign for stereophony was surely the October 1958 issue of High Fidelity magazine, in which the word stereo appears in ads, articles, and record reviews a total of 910 times. I counted them. Um, and is found on no fewer than 125 of its 168 pages. In these audio magazines, record critics began adding reviews of stereo LPs, often remarking on the way some orchestral music seemed particularly suited uh, to stereophonic recording. Writing in a 1959 review of a new stereo LP featuring Debussy's Image, performed by the Boston Symphony, uh, crit the critic Arthur Kahn noted that, quote, with the Bostonian's sterling sound, the stereophonic commodity makes a double dividend. Debussy's scoring is made to order for duo-channeled recording, unquote. Of course, many avant-garde creations exploit the possibilities of new recording technology. And of course, Pierre Schaeffer is the best and the first, uh, one of the first examples of this. Uh, these works demonstrate a phonograph effect, a term that Mark Katz coined to designate, quote, any change in musical behavior whether listening, performing, or composing that has arisen in response to sound recording technology. The phonograph effect can still be discerned in works that do not actually employ recordings or electronics, since Katz defines the effect broadly as, quote, any observable manifestation of recordings influence. It might be reasonable then to suppose that works for multiple orchestras or orchestras divided into spatialized groups, like the one I've, ones I've listed, um, were in part composed in response to new advances in multi-channel sound, even if these works employ no microphones, loudspeakers, or other electronic equipment. Although fully unplugged, they are historical artifacts of hi-fi culture, as Jonathan Stern uh, characterized. Uh, that's, the, that's, a, that's a phrase from Jonathan Stern, historical artifacts of hi-fi culture, uh, Jonathan Stern used to characterize the concept of soundscape in a recent essay. Pre-formatted stereophonic expectations may well have informed listeners' perceptions in a live context, too. Their first cue would have been visual via the unique seating arrangement of the, um, of the, uh, the unique seating arrangements um, of uh, each one of the pieces I I'm talking about. Each work offers different solutions to the problem of physically separating distinct musical timbres in space. And may well have reminded audiences of multi-speaker setups. The seating plan of double, for example, um, employs five groups of strings, four brass, um, and three woodwinds laid out across the stage. The woodwind groups form a triangle inscribed within a rectangle formed by the four brass groups. With this spatial layout, Boulez was able in his sketches to tag musical ideas with one of four labels, front left, rear left, front right, uh, uh, rear right. Now, Stockhausen's Gruppen uh, has three orchestras laid out in a horseshoe pattern around the audience, one on the left, one on the right, and one in the front. Uh, for Stockhausen's next spatial work, Carré, for four orchestras and choir, um, Stockhausen laid out the floor plan in this simple diagram, just having the uh, four orchestras on the four sides of, uh, of the room. It is tempting to compare these instrumental floor plans with the way contemporaneous audio magazines emphasized speaker placement for domestic stereophonic equipment, with schematic drawings being fairly commonplace. Um, advertised 
advertisements for hi-fi equipment promise to create the sensation of being surrounded by sound as a spot in that issue of hi-fi magazine I uh, mentioned uh, conveys. You see along the left the, mag the ad for Clipshorn uh, speakers. Um, and then this is another ad in the same issue. You are the fifth man in this quartet. Um, the listener in this photograph, in that photo, in that photo at the top, hears the sound of the first violin and viola of the string quartet as emanating from the rear right, and the and he and he hears the second violin and the cello as emanating from the rear left. A listening situation not afforded by any seat in a recital hall, but touted here as a desirable spatialized listening situation. Listeners at a concert of double or gruppen observing the unusual ways instruments were placed on a stage or around the audience would clearly sense a similarity with their own home experiments with stereo speaker placement. Now, did composers in their discourse on the work draw connections between the spatial properties of their works and stereophonic sound? Well, uh, for, as, for, as far as Boulez is concerned, um, in the note, that was included in the program of the 1958 premiere of Double, Boulez makes explicit reference to stereophony as the poetic source of the work. He writes, no one will contradict me when I claim that in our time, the ear requires stereophony in its desire for clarity and movement." End quote. An optimistic attitude towards stereo as an invention that had allowed for the conquest of musical space may have rubbed off on Boulez, who authored the program note to Double only a few months before the release of the first commercially distributed stereo LPs. In Boulez's 1963 monograph, based on 1960 lectures, Pensez la musique aujourd'hui, he even added references post facto um, to uh, the then recent technology of son and lumière shows. You can see the additions that he added at the bottom of the page of the manuscript uh, there, thereby cementing the links between his music and contemporaneous spatialized audiovisual technology. Um, he added the sentence, it is also at this time that son et lumière shows begin to take off. Um, after talking about Cinerama and the multi-speaker setups of Cinerama in the cinema. Um, while Boulez was invested in emphasizing the exploitation of space in double, Stockhausen took pains to stress the temporal properties um, of Gruppen, which he claims to be the raison d'etre for the three orchestra plan of the work. And yet, in his 1958 Music and Space lecture, Stockhausen claims that even though the spatial layout was mo motivated uh, by the structural need for superimposed tempi, it led him to a secondary interest in sound traveling through space as an end in itself. El elaborating on this idea, um, in his interview with Jonathan Cott, Stockhausen recalled that he began to think in terms of moving timbres. Uh, thus, even if temporal considerations are at a premium in Gruppen, the movement of sound in space is also significant. Whether Stockhausen spe specifically intended listeners to draw connections between the experience of hearing Gruppen in a concert hall and that of stereophony in the home or the cinema can be surmised indirectly from the program note published in his collected writings in which he considers the possibility of broadcasting a spatial work like Gruppen on the radio. Um, why broadcast this kind of music, etc. He says, well, radio will start broadcasting stereophonically in the not too distant future. Then the listener has more speakers in the room and will get at least an approximate idea of such space music. Even if Stockhausen regarded stereophonic broadcasting as inferior sound images of little inherent worth, he nevertheless draws a parallel in his passage between the kind of listening that Gruppen requires and the listening that a multi-speaker hi-fi stereo system affords. It's striking that just as Stockhausen asserts the primacy of the coordination of time over that of space, Boulez, who pinned the destiny of double on stereophonic technology at its premiere in 1958, systematically downplays the links to stereophony in his subsequent discourse on the work. In fact, I don't have time to demonstrate this here, but, uh, but, you can, uh, but you can take my word for it, that he stops talking about stereophony uh, when, he, when he speaks about the work after the 1958 premiere. Both of these stances may be rooted in a strategy of artistic negotiation. In a study of, quote, the discursive construction of a wall of aesthetic difference between multi-channel works inside 
and outside the electroacoustic studio, unquote, Patrick Valiket has shown how, with respect to electroacoustic music, quote, an ideology of aesthetic isolation supported the otherwise contradictory work of appropriating the tools of commercial broadcasting and recording. It may well be that Boulez and Stockhausen are at once accepting and rejecting their work's affinity with commercial and what they saw as unartistic stereophonic enterprises in an effort to construct such an aesthetic wall around their works, a trope reminiscent of Bourdieu's work on denial. I think. Now, in what particular ways uh, does sound travel, is sound travel exploited in the pieces uh, I'm focusing on here? Uh, the following passages contain what might be construed as sites of stereophonic effects in which a sound figure changes its physical position uh, with respect to the listener. Um, the passages of double that stage stereophony in the clearest way are the ones deploying what Boulez refers to in his sketches as the thème lent, or slow theme. This slow theme appears episodically in double with very long durations. Um, this slide um, indicates um, where, uh, which instrumental groups are playing for each part of this uh, theme, each one of its chords. You can sort of see where on the orchestral check chessboard uh, sounds are issuing. Um, nevertheless, it might be borne in mind that the instrumental groups shown here are far from the only ones sounding. Um, I set up a little a slide here, a little animation. You'll hear those chords, but only played on an electronic piano, not from the original recording. But we'll show you at each time where each one of those sounds is coming from uh, on the stage. But as I said, at the same time, other sounds are also coming out of other, uh, from other uh, corners of the orchestra uh, using other procedures that Boulez developed to give foreground interest to that background uh, schema, uh, pattern anyway. Um, so that probably thwarts an average listener's uh, attempts to hear the movement of specific sound figures moving in stereo fashion. Um, in the case of Gruppen, a uh, unique situation arises. Stockhausen pointed out a passage which has become a sort of locus classicus of discussion of the spatial conception of the work. Descriptions of this passage that are the ones that lead up to group 119 in the score um, find their way into most later scholarly discussions of the work. The passage was described by Stockhausen himself in his published interviews with Jonathan Cott. Um, he, he says, there's one spot um, that led to something I hadn't expected myself. A chord is moving from orchestra to orchestra with almost exactly the same instruments, horns and trombones. And what changes isn't the pitches, but rather the sound in space. Each orchestra, one after another, makes a crescendo, a crescendo and decrescendo rises and falls, and falls in volume. And at the moment when one starts fading out, the next orchestra begins to fade in, producing these very strong waves of revolving timbres. Um, so you see a kind of re reduction of that. Uh, passage here, and I'll play it to you because it's only lasts about five seconds. <laughs> good stereo system to be able to hear that sound traveling from side to side. Um, now, critics tended to follow suit, letting their gaze um, rest on the spinning brass chords of this group 119. Note that lasts only 19 seconds of this 22 minute work. Um, as if Stockhausen were aware of the way audiences responded to the passages of Gruppen that involved sounds traveling through space, he took pains to include such passages in his subsequent multi-orchestral effort, Carré. Um, 
these, uh, the, especially in these inserts that he composed in, in Carré, I don't have time to go into uh, here. These moments of sound figures changing positions were the easiest to parse and perhaps the ones that leave the most vivid impression on the listener and were the ones that critics by and large refer to in their reviews. The critical reception of these works that I'll get into now um, may well have been modulated by the massive advertising campaign that supported sales of hi-fi equipment and records. To what extent then did critics connect their experience of these spatial works to familiar experience most listeners already had of stereophonic sound? The answer seems at first simple, since it is likely that many concert goers entering the Rheinsaal of the Cologne exhibition grounds for the first performance of Gruppen would associate the seating plan with advertisements for stereo or even the placement of loudspeakers in their living rooms or in the cinema. Attendees at the premiere of Double, while watching stagehands rearrange the chairs and stands at length, uh, which famously prompted the Figaro's uh, critic, Clarendon, to notoriously dub the piece La Polka des Chaises, or musical chairs. Um, so the audience member sitting waiting while those chaise chairs are being rearranged might well have thought of speaker placement uh, in, in his or her living room. To some listeners, it was clear that spatial works like Double and Gruppen formed a kind of genre or indeed a fad, uh, such as Everett Helm, the critic, uh, writing about Boulez's poésie pour pouvoir and calling it, quote, uh, music im Raum, music in space, which nota bene is the clue to the latest musical fashions, unquote. Even Igor Stravinsky himself in a 1959 New York Times article uh, described how stereophony has already influenced composed music. He, com he claims that examples of this kind of music are Stockhausen's Gruppen and Boulez's Double. Stravinsky thus definitely believed that stereo technology was the source of inspiration of both Gruppen and Double and he was surely not the only listener to arrive at this conclusion. As far as the critical reception of Double goes, which I've, I've gone into at length uh, elsewhere, um, uh, suffice it to say that many critics described the first performance with no mention of stereophony at all. Others were disappointed not to have discerned any stereophonic effects in Double, blaming this absence, depending on their temperament, either on uh, or depending on their aesthetic, aesthetic allegiances, they blame this absence either on the composer, on Boulez, or on deficiencies, uh, shortcomings of their own ears. But as for Gruppen, uh, its parallels with stereophony were not lost on the first wave of critics. Writing in the American musical Courier, um, Horst Kögler noted that Gruppen is, quote, of course, stereophonic live music, that he puts in quotation marks, the word stereophonic. The effect is at first startling, he writes. Later on, however, it loses some of its erstwhile music on the move spell. The music in itself is not interesting enough to arrest one's attention, which begins to wander too." Unquote. With the words, of course, Kögler shows that the stereophonic aspect of Gruppen was obvious to him, and he assumed that it would have been obvious to all of his readers as well. At the same time, by placing the word stereophonic in quotation marks, he was expressing doubts about the possibility or interest of producing live stereophonic music. Um, uh, critics of the work's performance in the 1960s tended to take their cue from Stockhausen's all-powerful discourse on it. Most of them, most of these critics could not hear or were not listening for spatial effects. When critics did allow themselves to offer mild criticism of their experience, their target is revealing. The same Everett Helm, writing in the Saturday Review, came with the expectation of antiphonal effects and finds their relative absence a shortcoming. Um, he uh, quote, most of the time, his three uh, groups sounded like one huge orchestra that had overflowed from the stage into the hall. He left many of the possibilities of antiphonal effects unexploited. To conclude, uh, when technology comes into the story of post-war avant-garde music, it is usually the ways it can be used to construct works that is described. It's rarer to speak about the way sound technology is also an essential mode of reception for this repertoire. Technology does not only inflect the experience of listening, uh, and it is not unreasonable to suppose that audience members would experience spatial music through the prism of their own personal experimentations with the kinds of spatializations newly made possible at home. But what binds these works together over and above their chronological proximity uh, and their composition by composers of the same generation is a cluster of concerns. The incorporation of the parameter of space into the logic of musical composition on the one hand and listening 
for sound movement of the kind experienced in the cinema or in the home on the other. Um, the parallels between spatial orchestra works and the multiple sound sources of home and public stereo were underscored for listeners uh, even more emphatically when the works for, uh, were released on stereo LPs beginning in the later 1960s. Um, so in this way, these works might well have invited a certain form of listening, one mediated by audio technology, even if they do not use electronic means as such. Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan, for your presentation. We again would like to hear more music. But no. Thank you, Jonathan. This interaction, technology, position. Could you come back a little bit on a more anotype, the articles of the articles? And you have a certain question. You have a clue why Buna stopped speaking about mm. stereophony in the subsequent version of my new book. Yes, uh, thanks for asking that. Yes, uh, I do have a theory about that. Um, so first of all, the title, um, <clears throat> uh, Artifice of an Artifice, well, I thought that that was a nice way to tie in with the, with the, with the conference here. And I, I thought of uh, that uh, recording technology is, is already an artifice, a first degree of, uh, of uh, a first degree artifact. And then I thought that a multi uh, orchestra, a spatialized orchestral piece is an artifice of an artifice, is a second degree artifact. That was, that's what I was thinking of. Um, uh, but then about the way Boulez uh, played it down the, uh, the links of his work with, uh, with uh, stereo. I write about this in, in another paper, um, which I'll, I'll send you, by the way. Um, so this is the thing. There's a wonderful book by, uh, on, uh, exactly on this period, 1958 to 1963, by a, uh, a German sound studies uh, specialist named Jochen Stoller. And um, he uh, lays, and, and he really shows how, uh, and I use uh, his book because he really shows how um, uh, he studies um, recording techniques, recording in the studio, how um, stereo sound goes through different phases, uh, starting in the 1950s with a kind of realist attitude where recording engineers try to uh, achieve a, uh, a realistic reproduction of concert hall acoustics, uh, leading to an illusionist uh, phase where uh, where in the studio engineers try to heighten the experiences uh, that are made possible through the of, the of the new media without any necessarily trying to reproduce those uh, uh, that are can be experienced in a concert hall. And then he has a, a kind of a, a later stage, which is a kind of a tempered uh, illusionist kind of uh, position. And um, with with regards to Boulez, well, I think it really has to do with the fact that avant-garde composers have to walk a very dangerous kind of um, a narrow uh, path. Uh, on the one hand, they uh, have to appeal to technology because they're avant-garde, right? And innovation is is part of their credo, right? And so uh, they must uh, uh, hook their uh, destiny, their discourse on uh, on innovation and on technology. On the other hand, they know very well that uh, technology is destined to become obsolete. And they do not want, and they, and, and they still think of themselves as composers on the model of a 19th century romantic geniuses, and they want their works to be immortal, uh, eternal uh, uh, objects. And so they don't want uh, to attach, to hook the destiny of their works on the, on, on the technology. And so that's why I made a reference to Bourdieu's concept of denial, uh, uh, because they have to at once uh, avow and disavow uh, their allegiance to the technology. That's, that's what I think. Uh, just to follow up on that, and, and then a question. In, in France, in particular, um, technology is perceived, or at the, at the time at least, as vulgar, and Boulez uh, would not want that. Uh, well, but yeah, but that, but why did he add the reference to Son et Lumière in his book then? Well, and then he took it out. And no, it, no, no, no. He, well, later sorry, on, he, he downplayed all that as well, because Son et Lumière was a, a height of fashion in, in, in early 60s, and then it, it came down as being too, too common. Um, uh, you might want to add in your, um, in, in your uh, field of study for that topic, the, the exhibit, the ex Universal Exposition of 58, with the Universal. Philips Pavilion. 
which was meant as a demonstration of uh, the possibilities of course. Of, uh, Where the first part of uh, Pousseur, the piece I didn't get the chance to talk to yeah. now, but Rim, yeah. uh, the first uh, movement of Rim was premiered at the 58 yeah, uh, right. Brussels uh, exhibition. And, and so, of course. And Varese, uh, for Electronique, of course, and, yes. Uh, on of course. Yeah. The only reason I didn't want to talk about uh, Pour Electronique is, of course, because I'm interested in uh, analog uh, reproductions of spatialization, not electronic ones. But, uh, but yeah, it, it ties right in, I think, with the same kind of uh, uh, problem. Okay. Any other comments? If not, we go, we come to our third speaker this afternoon, Christoph Kollar. He's lecturer in European literature, critical theory, and contemporary performing arts at the Free University of Brussels, and he's also secretary of the Center for Literary and Oh, oh, oh I love it. It. The title of his presentation, Adaption as Artifice. Thanks very much. Oh, sure. I'll be your roadie. <laughs> this is very fun. Thanks for being here. Um, I must admit, I'm, as you heard from the introduction, not a musicologist at all. Um, I barely touch upon something musical, um, but I have absolutely no idea what I'm talking about. Um, <laughs> but I must say, I really, really enjoyed the passion and the expertise of the two previous speakers. So. But I really think I have nothing in common with it. <laughs> That's why those conferences are interesting. Otherwise, yeah, yeah. We'd, we'll be all among ourselves. <laughs> it's true. It's very generous. I think that this needs to start up again because yeah, uh, it's coming. Ad -nope, yeah. Oh, here. Have a good feeling. When Quebecois dramaturg director Robert Lepage staged his damnation of Faust at the New York Metropolitan in 2008, it effectively concerned a production that was old and new at the same time. After all this multimedia rerouting of Berlioz's 1846 opera had been redesigned continually ever since its Japanese premiere in 1999 to keep accommodating ever more sophisticated digital technologies while generating new environments to tell the same story. Interestingly though, the more sophisticated the sonographies became, the more Lepage's audiences seemed to widen almost as if the artist had made a devilish pact with technology to mesmerize the public. From its beginnings as a Protestant morality play in the form of Johann Spies's Faustbuch, 1587, the Faustian legend has subverted cultural standards and generic structures. Goethe's Faust, 1532, most notably, is presented as eine Tragödie, a tragedy yet features a wide array of literary forms, ranging from a metatheatrical prologue and varying poetic rhyme schemes to the employment of song texts and opera libretto. As demonstrated by Katja Rutger, even from its inception, the Faustian myth has always been a media history of sorts, in the sense of an inquiring mind applying virtually all technical means known to man in his pursuit of knowledge yet also in terms of the story's transition from orally recounted legend over its countless written reworkings to the truly transmedial phenomenon it has become today. 
obviously in itself representing a sheer endless source of artistic inspiration, the Faust story becomes, however, especially salient in the case of experimental sonographer Robert Lepage, with his, with his own seemingly endless, endless returns to the material. For even before addressing the technical aspect of his ever adapting designs, said perspective expresses an attitude to authorship that seems to privilege authentic inquiry over artificial adjustments. Moreover, Lepage's choice to engage with the Faust motif through the prism of opera offers another variation on the principle. After all, as demonstrated by Frida Chappell, opera, and especially digital opera like Lepage's Damnation, constitutes an intermedial phenomenon, quote, located in between the medium of instrumental music, the song lyric and spoken word performed by the singing actor and the mise-en-scene, which may or may not include multimedia representation. This coupled to a remediation of the medium of music with the medium of dramatic literature that is the libretto. Even in their most basic guise, performing arts in effect have always thrived on what uh, Carlson has called a consciousness of doubleness, with their typical intensity deriving not from clear distinctions, but rather from tensions, ambiguities, or associations. The particular brand of high-tech, heavily digitized scenographies promulgated by Lepage however, amps up the intrinsic interlatedness of stage signifiers by presenting his spectators with a straightforward story told through ensembles of modes simultaneously. An aesthetic approach performance scholar Bonnie Maranka came to call performance as design. Confirmed by semiotician Gunther Kress, as the sine qua non in, multimedial communica in multimodal communication of informed, reflective, and productive practice, design provides us with reading paths without imposing interpretation, as it shifts attention from thematic issues and the essences of meaning to the material and processual dimensions of signification. Since we are dealing here with an elusive art form, the elusiveness of which is further underscored by techno-driven polysystemic analogies, the underlying design transpires as perspective, future-oriented, rather than a mesmerizing attempt to align audiences with the artist's private agenda. Under the adage that the new applications allow for new perspectives, one could disclaim that Robert Lepage struck a pact with technology, not to gain absolute wisdom, but in an unending attempt to understand and communicate its potential. Effectively transforming the playing area into, quote, a magic casement of living collage, this artist in his damnation of Faust even made the imagery react to music, singers, pitch, sibilance or tempos by an organically morphing mediascape. So that mics on the singers and over the orchestra pit gauge volume and pitch, while a system of infrared lights and cameras detected motion, thus famously enabling a flock of swirling digital birds to change directions as Faust modulated his pitch, and that flames engulf the image of the soprano singing d'amour l'ardent de flamme, Sorry. <laughs> the seamless transitions operated by Lepage's digital sonographies generate, if anything, a first general impression of interrelatedness, narratively, but also semiotically, as all stage signifiers seem to fluidly feed off one another. Stefan Kramer called this an instance of hyperculture, an environment in which everything can pot potentially be mixed with everything else but which need not imply meaninglessness, as hyperculture precisely involves the old and new simultaneously. The semiologist André Albo, from Brussels, 
This is nowhere more prevalent than in the performing arts, on behalf precisely of their boundless capacity to integrate any mode or medium imaginable and polysystemic reliance on analogies. Moreover, when we add adaptation into the mix, set intersemiotic correspondences find their arguably most evocative extension. With intra and intersemiotic transfers alike, the relation systematically recasts a certain meaning potential without transforming it altogether. The distinction is significant and not in the least for an artist like Lepage with his predilection for doublings of all kinds, which nonetheless never allow the comfort of clear-cut distinction. A video projection of a performer is never just a mediatized extension, but the recast of our initial impression into a now fully reciprocal relationship between a certain signifier and its intersemiotic echo. Lepage added, Ludovic Fouquet struck the right note when he claimed that, quote, there is a division or sharing of tasks that is a way of creating a sort of hall of mirrors of the theatrical image and the image on stage. From this angle, then, the decision to engage with the Faust myth makes even more sense. After all, to Erich Heller, the modern day Faustus, as opposed to his legendary <coughs> medieval counterpart, recognizes that his restlessness of spirit is his greatest sin, yet at the same time also his only means of salvation. It is a motif already spelled out in the last scene of Goethe's version by the angels carrying Faustus to heaven. Wer immer streben sich bemüht, den können wir erlösen. Or whoever strives in ceaseless toil, him we may grant redemption insist on the May. Hector Berlioz's 1846 damnation was also based on Goethe's version and not in the least given the composer's personal interest in science and technology. At the same time though, he clung to the aesthetics of romantic opera with its tragic hero narrative, the privileging of intuition over rationality and the idealization of nature. It is an uneasy tension which was historically prevalent in opera houses at the time, where a vogue of medievalist fantasy clashed with the working class life of a rapidly industrializing Europe outside the building. Unsurprisingly, it is this element Lepage chose as stepping stone for his own adaptation, yet recast in a markedly more constructive way. I quote, I'm always interested in when the composer wrote. Berlioz was working in the Paris of the Siècle de Lumière, the century of light. Paris was the center point where all the ideas converged, where all the people became very obsessed with all the new technical devices and really believed in the machine. Lepage's production, as a result, was also set in the mid 19th century and in arguably one of the most remarkable scenes, Faust and Mephistopheles are seen riding into hell on projected horses inspired by the famous Victorian stop motion studies done by Edward Newbridge that would lay the foundation for later moving pictures. Thus giving it an eerie feel of retro futurist fluidity. But whereas Goethe's Faust is redeemed and released by angels, Berlioz and, Lepa and Lepage's venal philosopher is damned to hell, or so it seems, for definitive denouements and the art of Lepage make two. And once again, is this nowhere clearer than in this artist's adaptations? When we consider the adaptation principle from the prism of reception, it transpires that, quote, any rewriting or adaptation of text is always influencing the perception of the original work. This analogy fuel logic of reciprocal inter-illumination is, as mentioned, one of Lepage's aesthetic first principles, especially given its inherent liberationist potential. 
the importance of analogies in the adaptation and Lepage's artist in adaptation and Lepage's artistic practice alike and cannot be overstated. They are a product of intuitive associations and as argued by Umberto Eco, metaphorical relations like the analogy constitute a scandalous semiotic phenomenon permitted by almost all semiotic systems. Now, if an artist communicates on an analogous content across multiple modes simultaneously, this marks an instance of performative metareference, which, if anything, shifts focus from the what question, underpinning, thema underpinning thematic analysis, to how the communicative relation between artist and audience is constituted. To media theorist Friedrich Kittler, aesthetics always begins as pattern recognition, and artworks that specifically underline their intersemiotic interconnectedness have the power, quote, to optimize our mechanism of recognition in general. Perspective offered by intermediality is therefore particularly helpful in this regard, since to Lars Ellerström, it implies a certain irreducible intertextual flux between communicative modes that effectively draws attention to the borders that separate them, either by combination and integration or by ostensible mediation. In a video preview for his Damnation's 1999 premiere, at the Saito Kinen Festival in Japan, Lepage expressed a similar view when discussing his role as opera director, not decorating the composer's score, but rather, quote, extend its energy. And lest it be forgotten, this was precisely the prime motivation behind the development of the opera art form in late Renaissance Italy, an era moreover conspicuously concurrent with the birth of the Faust myth. In order to stage Berlioz's damnation of Faust, Lepage built a structure composed of 24 vertical quadrants, a giant picture book, in his own words, through which he could generate seemingly endless variations of a certain motif. The structure then was used simultaneously as a playing space and backdrop for fluid digital projections and video segments. Taken together, the digital morphings, metaphorical variations, and multimodal patterns all come together to exude a general impression of malleability. If anything, therefore, Lepage's approach to this adaptation situates him as an epistemological director who understands that mise-en-scene is, quote, more than merely a directorial arrangement but effectively an engine for spectatorship. This in practice situates him not as a director, but as a dramaturg. For as explained by Duska Radosavljevic, the dramaturg holds a key role as liaison between playtext and mise-en-scene, and therefore is damned in true Faustian fashion to a permanent state of in-betweenness. Primarily concerned not with formal details per se, but rather with coordinating conceptual coherence and processes of signification, the dramaturg's role is primarily an integrative one. As so transpires, the work of the dramaturg then does not merely concern the transposition of a text into a performance, but rather a conceptu conceptually coherent fitting which consists in putting the text, script, or score under dramatic and scenic tension. Lepage, though, goes a step further and adds technology into the mix, so that even pairing the concepts of intermediality and dramaturgy does not suffice to assess the synesthetic specificity of his work. As demonstrated by analogy theorist Gilles Fauconnier, a general operation of conceptual blending is at work in many linguistic and non-linguistic situations that makes extensive use of cross-space mappings. Where new associations are forged, novel structures emerge. 
and given their blended nature, they seamlessly extend existing knowledge with new applications. Of course, digital technologies greatly contributed to this insight, as their devices, events, and activities automatically appear as mutually constituting and hence interdependent. Yet Lepage's art was long before the digital turn imbued by this kind of thinking, as witnessed by his idiosyncratic blend of all things modal, dramatic, and technical. More than epistemological director or a techno-euphoric dramaturg, this effectively makes him an emancipatory scenographer, signifying the sum total of a theatrical production's technical components, scenography intrinsically implies, again, the aesthetic coordination of everything not directly related to the physical performance. As such, it thrives on a concretized mixture of imagination and know-how, while evoking a certain conceptual pattern informing each of its components. The principle of scenography, as a result, comes to materialize a generative tension between metaphorical shorthand and technological extension. To Rachel Han, scenography should thus be considered a fabric of performance, as it weaves together various layers of signification while stimulating the construction and reception of theatrical meaning. By the continuous interplay on stage of multiple modes, signifiers, and signifying systems, live theatrical presence, therefore, more than ever, reflects a phenomenological hybrid permanently in a state of becoming. The spatial designs crafted by Robert Lepage were at once rigidly scripted and effectively elusive. It is thus precisely the unifying process here at work with its particular heuristic relevance, and not in the least in the digital age. As Steve Dixon convincingly argued in his landmark study, Digital Performance, quote, the conjunction of performance and new media has and does bring about genuinely new stylistic and aesthetic modes, as well as unique and unprecedented performance experiences, genres, and ontologies, end quote. The work of sonographers then, theater artists who rely primarily on the reciprocity and entanglement of ideas and concepts, signifiers and signifying systems, recasts the quiddity of theatrical performance, the phenomenological actuality of the smells, colors, textures, sounds, and movement of performance. In short, a lived experience of being in the presence of performance, and this despite the perceived depersonalization of the digital. Cue back to Lepage's Faust adaptation, perennially in progress, which from this angle appears as just another confirmation of his holistic thinking and hypermedial practice. As it forces us to infer coherence from several strata of signification simultaneously, it effectively shifts the quality of our response from reading as interpretation to reading as design, whereby we, spectators, become acutely aware of our own agency in the process. Moreover, Lepage's left field approach to the adaptation principle itself as open, potential driven, and future oriented reminds that thematic content and cultural cachet merely facilitate this engagement with the material. In so doing, Lepage sidesteps fossilized essentialist readings while forcing his audiences to confront and recast their own now authentic principles of analysis and assessment. Digital damnation never looked so liberal. Thank you very much. Thank you, Christoph. So, Thank you for this return to the visual discussion. It's, it's a small point, but perhaps it could help you out. 
um, la, dam la damnation de Faust as a traditional opera is a problematic opera. Yes. It, it, it's a, not difficult to stay. Yeah, it's difficult to stay, and it's, it's not very convincing. Mm -hmm. the, all the, the uh, um, imaginary parts that you see in Goethe's uh, work, they just could not quite pull it off. So it left a space for, for this process that yes. you, you... That's what I found so very intriguing yeah. about this case, because he could not to put it disrespectful, even though I don't want to be, he lacked <coughs> theatrical knowledge. He did. Yeah. He, he had big visions, but not the means to... He didn't really understand the medium of opera well enough to see yeah. what it could do, what it couldn't do. Yeah. So it, that gives a space to look at the Lopat, which is uh, interesting. The Productions are more interesting than the original uh, opera. In my view, I am very happy with that comment. To be honest, I mean, this was also my impression, but I don't know anything. No, that's why I'm I you. like music a lot. I yeah. love music, but I don't know music. So I'm an coming opera, from you, this is yeah. I'm an opera, I'm not quite specialist, but yeah, I, I would say so. That's very interesting. Mm -hmm. I can really work with that. Thank you. I have also a question, but I'm not sure how to phrase it. Um, what I very much like uh, about your presentation is the many, many different kinds of references that you use in building up your argument. And I'm wondering what's actually the method behind it? Behind my own? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so you start with a case and then wonder how does it relate to Earlier works. And it's, it's kind of well, I think I used a quote at one point by Robert Le Pai, um, and I'm, my, my thinking is very similar. Um, I mean, I don't want to sound pretentious at all, but um, I simply think when I, you know, I develop an idea, I think, what does this idea need, and what do I have, you know? To furnish this idea, and what else do I need to furnish it further? Because yeah. then I go to my sources and I say, "Well, okay, this tells this. This gives me some clues, um, and I supplement it with my own ideas. But then I, I feel that I fall short, and then I go looking elsewhere and then try to find them. And that way, it's just mm -hmm. really very functional approach." But uh, the 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 intermediality. Uh you were talking about is very much focused on, on the one side on uh, intermediate references mm -hmm. as you could see them kind of intertextuality maybe but on the other side uh, from uh, the concepts that you use the reference to uh, and to uh, Dixon and to, so from many different backgrounds well, I, when I develop an argument, I always try to be as disingenuous as possible, really, um, not to take myself too seriously, and really try to look at the phenomenon I'm trying to describe without preconception. Mm -hmm. So I'm just rebuilding everything with every new paper from the from the bottom up. Saying, what yeah, does this yeah. need? And and how do I perceive this phenomenon? This, for instance, you know, this, it's very difficult to make an, a radical distinction between this is the intertextual level and this is the, the purely material level because there is a clear association at work. Um, this is also what a person like Robert Lepage plays with. You know, this is this sort of homology, this is the thing, uh, the common message that comes to you from all these different channels. And I try to reproduce that in my own art because this is what first strikes you when you engage with this material. Hence the approach. So is it for you a kind of, uh, and don't uh, take it negative, no. a kind of um, productive eclecticism? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah? Yeah. yeah. Um, because this is, um, how my research is always developed, but um, sort of always ended up working on these um, 
hybrid thing. And it sort of, to me, looks um, inconsistent than to be orthodox in my approach. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> in this way, I like principles. <laughs> Just a short point. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure if you're aware, Berlioz was a mostly literary man mm -hmm. himself. He, he, he earned a living for a long time as a musical critic. And, uh, uh, and uh, he also was quickly to Germany, which is rather rare. In but that, that struck me, you know, because it comes very early, this opera. And it's and it's very clearly based on Goethe. So yeah, it's, yeah. It's, it's he strange. had strong, strong links with. Uh, with Weimar and, and this, and uh, he was uh, better known in, in Germany for a time than in France. You might want to read his memoirs. Yeah, I definitely will. You know, it, yeah, it's, it's very it's, well written, very interesting. I just tapped into this and I thought, this is very rich potential. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because it will shed some light on Robert Lepage's work. Mm -hmm. I'm sure Lepage has read a lot of them. I'm very grateful for it. Yeah. There are no more questions. Right, thank, thank you very, very much. much. Thank, you. thank you to the presenters. Thank you to the audience. Coffee. <laughs> <laughs>